thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it's my pleasure here to have Ambassador Ted Osius with us um, this week to talk about his book, Nothing is Impossible. Um, before we get into the webinar, I just wanted to do a little bit of administrative work. So I'm Eddie Molesky. I'm the director of the Duke Center for International Development and also the um, president of the Southeast Asian Research Group, which is a multi-campus initiative. Um, this talk is sponsored by the Duke Center for International Studies, the Asian Pacific Studies Institute, and both DCID and CREG. Today, we're delighted to have Ambassador Ted Odysseus. Um, he's a diplomat for 30 years. Um, he served from 2014 to 2017 as the U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, um, a country he's known and loved since 1995. Um, only the second um, out gay career diplomat in U.S. history to achieve the rank of ambassador, Osius went to Vietnam with both his husband um, and children, um, um, which was, um, it was just a fascinating um, and wonderful opportunity, both how, how Ambassador Osius handled that engagement and his reception um, from the Vietnamese. Since his departure from government, OCS um, heads the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, and earlier he was the Google Asia Pacific um, Vice President for Government Affairs and Public Policy. Um, I want to talk a little. We'll get a chance. OCS has Ambassador OCS has a um, just a really rich and robust diplomatic history um, and academic history as well, and we'll get into that over the course of this discussion. But I, I want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about the book. And so I have some questions that I'm going to raise for him. For the rest of you that are on the webinar, if you want to ask questions too, you can put them in the Q&A session. And as they pop up, I'll see them and can get to them as well. So this is the blurb I wrote for the book um, when I read it. Um, While millions of pages have been written about the terrible war between the United States and Vietnam, the two countries' fraught and complicated efforts to rebuild diplomatic and economic relations afterward has been understudied and misunderstood. Ted Osius' is Nothing is Impossible beautifully fills this important gap. Told from the perspective of a diplomat on the front lines of the negotiation, the stories Osius shares is, are both deeply personal and revelatory. Readers will learn new facts about the incremental steps toward reconciliation while being introduced to a cast of compelling characters who shape the process. Although the writing is punchy and the storytelling is enthralling, this is also a well-researched contribution to diplomatic history. Nothing is impossible is as suitable for the classroom as it is for a fun summer read. Um, I also, so, you know, since, since the book came out, some reviewers have praised it and compared it to one of my favorite books of all time, which is Present at the Creation um, by Dean Acheson. It's a, that's a monumental history of U.S. Um, institution building of after post-World War II. And, and I don't think that praise is misplaced. Um, when you read this book, you have the same feeling of being invited backstage to history-changing events. But, but beyond just that, what Ambassador Osius does really well is he tells a love story about Vietnam, both his coming to understand in Vietnam and learn its cultural history. Um, and he provides a lot of personal reflections that even helped me, someone who's studied this country for over two decades, understand it better. And so I do, so I just want to give it the highest praise and I'll hopefully in this conversation, we'll be able to give you a little bit of taste of everything that's in the book. Um, so Ted, thank you so much for joining us today. So um, I wanted to start off by just sort of asking you, you know, about that, you know, your first introduction to Vietnam, which you, you know, so, you know, you had the opportunity, you, you selected to go at Vietnam. So what was it that brought you to first launch your career in Vietnam in, in 1995? So let me start by thanking you, uh, Professor Molesky. And I'm going to call you Eddie, if that's okay. Because we've been <laughs> friends for so long. And please call me Ted. We've been friends for a long time. We both have had love affairs with Vietnam. And uh, over the years, I've been super happy to learn from you. And I, you just read that uh, blurb, uh, the beautiful blurb that you wrote for the book. Thank you for that. But thank you even more for uh, your many years of collaboration uh, on everything to do with Vietnam. I've gone to you for wisdom again and again, and uh, I've never been sorry. So, so you asked uh, why, why Vietnam? And the answer is pretty simple. Um, I was at an inflection point, it was early in my career, and I thought, what could be more interesting 
than to go to a place where we had this terrible, bloody relationship and see if it wasn't possible to start something new. And so I started thinking about it in uh, about 1994 and then uh, got really serious in 1995 and uh, asked to be one of the first officers ever uh, sent to Vietnam since the war. And then I went through kind of a hazing, which is learning Vietnamese mm. uh, for about 10 months before I actually uh, got there. Um, although I had an immersion, an opportunity to go and, and do an immersion program and really sink my teeth into the language. But this is a long time ago. This is right when we started, uh, mm. we, right after we reestablished diplomatic relations. And so it was very exciting to me to be there kind of at the beginning. And every time I would do a meeting, it would be the first time anybody any, anybody had met an American official for you know, 17, 22, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I felt, well, I'm, I'm here at the right time. I'm here to, to see this new relationship unfold. And then amazingly, I had the opportunity to go back as ambassador and mm -hmm. what a privilege that was. Yeah. So I, I wanted to talk to you about that, that first sort of period when you first got to Vietnam in 1995 and that, um, and the normalization of relations there. And so, you know, I, I guess it, I wanna, there's two very interesting personalities that you get to work with very closely at that time. Desai Anderson, um, who opened up the first sort of US um, um, diplomatic presence after the war. And then of course, um, Pete Peterson. And um, I thought I was sort of hoping that you could give us a sense of both what, how, you know, the two of them perceived their project in Vietnam and what it was like to work um, with them in that mission. And it's funny, these memories are very fresh right now because a group of us got together, a group of 12 of us got together for lunch yesterday to talk about to say. Oh. So uh, he was a, a mentor and a friend and a wonderful, wonderful diplomat. He, he died not long ago. And uh, so a group of us got together and had a lunch where we just talked about Desai. It was uh, pretty fantastic. Desai had a very clear, I think a very clear image. He'd been given no instructions. He'd basically been sent out, you know, said, set up, you know, set up an embassy. <laughs> and almost no instructions. Um, really? <laughs> two books on, mm -hmm. on uh, one American in Hanoi and then a, a, a broader book about the reconciliation process, which I think will come out later this year, mm -hmm. uh, posthumously. Uh, but he, he knew that at the foundation was this question of fullest possible accounting for those whom we'd lost. That was so important on the American side that it, the, this was, remember this was the time of the Rambo films yeah. and and rumors about uh, American prisoners being held in tiger cages. And there, there were a lot of unscrupulous politicians who were using these fears and these concerns in ways that were harmful to the families, I believe, and that made it impossible, almost impossible to move forward normalizing the relationship. And that was the Gordian knot that had to be cut. And so Desai was quite fixed on this issue of fullest possible accounting and how we could get the how we could get as much information we, as we could about those whom we we lost, and but he realized that on the Vietnamese side there was another impediment, which is to rejoin the to join the world economy. Mm -hmm. The key for the Vietnamese was to have an economic relationship with the United States. So that's what that was kind of the trade off, yeah. and what. To say also understood because he was such a great diplomat is especially when you're dealing with an old adversary you've got to build trust and you've got to do it slowly you've got to do it step by step by step and and you have to keep delivering if you're going to be build trust and he understood that extremely well and then uh you asked about pete yeah, so I just I just to follow up really quickly on this trust building so you know so you were there at the time so you saw this of this this, you know, the joint work together and joint teams working together on accounting, you know, and it was, and I think one of the things that comes out in the book is your sort of sympathy for the Vietnamese, that it wasn't just Americans, that they were also 
really wanted to be able to account for their own. And so I just wanted to get your sense of, of how that trust enfolded between the two sides before we could get to work on the harder questions. Well, uh, I mean, you, you know better than anybody. There's a, in Vietnamese culture, the, until a person has been laid to rest, until the remains of a person have been laid to rest, his or her soul is said to wander the earth. And so it's extremely important in that culture to be able to uh, provide closure. We were quite focused on providing closure for American families because that was our job. Um, but the Vietnamese also wanted closure for their families. And, and you know, somewhere between two and three million Vietnamese died during the course of that, of that conflict. And uh, it took a long time mm -hmm. before we started, we made any effort really to address that concern. Uh, we kind of uh, put that on the Vietnamese and we focused on uh, fullest possible accounting for those whom we'd lost. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is prob probably of necessity. It was probably the only way to get the relationship going. Uh, so to say, you know, have, you know, knowing that it's the, the tools in his toolbox were limited, just used all of them. How could you build trust? So you work together on things that were apolitical, mm -hmm. like standard setting, like science and technology collaboration, like health collaboration, and then slowly built up towards uh, a trade and security relationship, but slowly, step by step. And trade was essential because the yeah. country at that time, more than 50% of the of Vietnamese lived below the poverty line. Right. living on less than two dollars a day and uh i would just mention to those of you who are listening professor maleski was instrumental working with other people working with partners but in setting up a virtuous cycle which led to vietnam's development and then ultimately its takeoff so that you know today less than six percent or something mm -hmm. around six percent live below the poverty mm -hmm. line so it's been a phenomenal economic story and in the, that is that is very nice of you to <laughs> I appreciate it. I I mean I feel my role was simply to document it. I thought I think it was the Vietnamese entrepreneurs and business people working to do that that had more to do with it than anything well, I could have done. It was more than that. Um because what you you were able to do when when you set up uh uh this sort of kind of competitive system where provinces would compete for the best rankings in terms of whether they were friendly to foreign investment, um, the, the provincial competitiveness index, when you set up that index, you set in motion a, uh, a process by which uh, officials saw the future of their, mm -hmm. of their promotions and their, their careers tied to how well they did in attracting foreign capital. And so in first in clumps around Da Nang and around Ho Chi Minh City and a little bit in the north. And then gradually as, as uh, leaders saw, well, you know, my neighboring province is doing really well and, and the head of that province's career has just gone way up. I better get, on, get with the program. Yeah. <laughs> so the provincial competitiveness index had a lot to do with the economic reforms that followed those years that you and I were first there. That is so nice of you to say. But I will, but it does get to this point that they were very interested in finding ways to, you know, reduce this poverty trap that they were in. I think that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. They sure were. They sure were. And they did see the United States as key. And first to say, and then Pete Peterson, the first US ambassador to Vietnam, um, took advantage of this. They saw that if we could move towards a bilateral trade agreement with Vietnam, especially one that would ultimately lead Vietnam into the World Trade Organization, uh, it opened up the field for collaboration and actually would enable us to then build the trust that we needed to have yeah. a comprehensive relationship. And you had to be able to address the concerns of the other side, not just the, the concerns of the United States. And I think the day that, that Pete arrived, you know, sixth US, their first US ambassador to Vietnam a former prisoner of war, uh, a former member of Congress, appointed by Clinton, in part because he had been a prisoner of war. How right. can you, former prisoner of war, of being soft on the communists, yeah. uh, someone who had been tortured in a Vietnamese prison, 
how could he be accused by members of Congress as being too soft? Right. Well, it was, it was a lot of things, but he certainly wasn't soft. And he announced day one, we're going to go full steam ahead with this process of fullest possible accounting. And our, our goal is to conclude a bilateral trade agreement. In fact, he stayed, he even stayed as a Democrat, but he stayed on into the uh, George W. Bush administration right. in order to complete that job of uh, concluding a bilateral trade agreement, which I would argue, and one of the people uh, who was at the lunch yesterday was Joe DeMond, who negotiated that BTA. I would argue that that bilateral trade agreement was what helped set Vietnam on the path that it was then on uh, mm -hmm. for, for growth to about 2008, when it really took off because because uh, Europeans, Asians, Americans uh, who are doing business with Vietnam saw it as a good place to invest. And from about 2008 on, it was a darling of for foreign investment. It just was like a magnet attracting uh, foreign investment. And that I think has allowed it to, to really take off uh, economically. But yeah. we were part of that. We, uh, Pete was part of that. You were part of that. I, was, I played a little role. Uh, to say was part of that because we helped kind of usher uh, Vietnam into the global economy. Well, you, you said you played a little role, but like this was a startup embassy and you were wearing a number of different hats, you know, like covering and like, so it, I, well, talk a little bit about that, about all the new sort of interesting responsibilities that were thrown on you at this time. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a startup venture. <laughs> the, well, the, it, it was really fun. I didn't have a boss and that's always a, a fun situation to be in. Yeah. Uh, they hadn't, didn't have a political counselor yet. So yeah. there was one other political officer, uh, Brian Dalton yeah. and I, who were the ones who kind of uh, got things launched. And because we had a deputy chief of mission who was seemed to be focused elsewhere, mostly on management, um, we reported directly to the charge, uh, to Desai. And you know, we, we took our marching orders from him and we just went out and did it. And we would sometimes sit down in these little cafes where you could get um, you could get noodles for about 50 cents and uh, you know hovering over a little fire and we'd say okay it's a really crazy busy week I've got a congressional delegation you've got this you've got we divide up the work and then we just go out and do it and we were we were hosting an enormous number of delegations which was good necessary but then we were also fielding you know millions of questions from the Vietnamese and from the State Department yeah. uh, it was a really busy and hectic time. And then we opened up a consulate in Ho Chi Minh City. And right. that was a blast because I was the first political officer there. And, and really everything I did in the former Saigon was the first time an American had done it in 22 years. Right. And it was so interesting and so much fun. And I, I, I loved every single minute of it. I had, you know, a I was only able to be torn away because I got a great job at the White House. Yeah. Uh, but I, I loved that. And then, you know, stayed closely in touch with, with Vietnam in the, in the years after that until I had the uh, great, great fortune to go back as ambassador. So I want to, so I want to get to the time that you were ambassador because there's just, you worked on so many fascinating projects at that time, but I did want to, there's a, you know, there's a, this, this fantastic story that you tell and to some extent it anchors the book because um, you know, your bicycle riding through Vietnam is sort of this theme that comes up again and again in the book at, at really important times. But I, but there's, you sort of talk about this story of you riding from North to South Vietnam, going over the Hai Von Pass and, um, and how that really, you know, changed your perceptions of the country and also brought you closer to the country. And I, um, and I, you know, you know, as someone who's reflecting back on a very successful diplomatic career, you know, it's these sorts of moments of serendipity that I think really matter. And I thought it would, I thought it'd be really interesting for people to hear that story as well. Well, I love to bike. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I had, I, I just thought it would be really exciting to bike the 1200 miles from Hanoi to Saigon. And I thought, surely I'll learn something about this country that I, I found so fascinating. And we did, there were nine of us from a number of different countries and we rode you know, we actually saw the, all the different rice cycles by riding from north to south. We saw, you know, uh, the seedlings to the, mm. the, the drying of the rice. And it, it's a rice culture. 
Right. We, Vietnam has like 10 different words for rice, all of these different stages, right? That's the hardest part about learning Vietnamese is all the different yeah, words. <laughs> like Eskimos having all these different words for snow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vietnamese have lots of things that are focused on rice, lots of words and, mm -hmm. and uh, myths and uh, songs. And, and so it's, it's integral to the culture. And, but we also, we were moving at kind of the prevailing speed. There weren't very many cars. There were, you know, honking big trucks on that on Highway One, but there weren't that many cars, and there were lots of people on bicycles, and people would just kind of ride along with us. And we were like the circus come to town because we were big and dressed in, you know, <laughs> bright colored spandex. And uh, one of our team members was like six four, and he would he had all these little wind up frogs that he would give to kids and balloons, uh -huh. and. You know, so so like villages would come out to meet us, and then I would speak, and they, you know, they look like this because this guy who looks like me spoke Vietnamese, and that mm -hmm. was very astonishing, uh, a very a very rare thing in those days, and not many people in those days, very few people spoke English, um, but mm -hmm. I I had spent that time learning Vietnamese, I had learned so much on that trip, but let me just tell you one specific story from that trip because to me it, it kind of embodies something very important about this reconciliation process. I was on a bridge. Uh, it was in the uh, former DMZ in Guangxi province, it used to cut the country in half between North and South. And I was looking out over this landscape and there were all these ponds and uh, a woman was next to me, a little bit older than I. And um, I asked her, why are there all of these strangely shaped Ponds right here, and she said, "Well, that's where the Americans drop bombs on us." And then she, you know, proceeded to tell me you know, how many <laughs> years later, mm -hmm. but it still hurts. How many, how many members of her family had died as uh, as a result of the American bombings, and the the number of people in her village who had died. And I, I, I was, you know, I was feeling very small and kind of wanting not to confess who I was, but I thought, well, I got, she's been honest with me. I need to tell her. I represent the United States of America. I work for the embassy. Um, you know, that's who I am. And I, this is all in Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And she used the most familial of Vietnamese terms, she said, Beza Chunta La Chi En. So today, you and I are brother and sister, and not like uh, the sort of the distant terms of an official, mm -hmm. American official, but mm -hmm. an older sister, younger brother. Mm -hmm. These intimate terms that made me part of her family. Yeah. And I just, I was. I'm still struck by this because it was such a spirit of forgiveness, reconciliation, willingness to look forward and, and to be friends. And I feel like that's at the core of why this reconciliation worked out. It was the willingness of the Vietnamese people to look beyond a really painful past and open the door to a very different future and to a, a really comprehensive friendship and partnership. Yeah. And to me, that was so phenomenal. And it, uh, you know, sort of guided my efforts to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the reason I think I wanted to tell this story so much uh, because mm -hmm. I, I was so bowled over by that. And I've been bowled over all of the 30 years that I've been dealing with Vietnam by, by that spirit of reconciliation, that willingness to to reconcile with the country that had blasted them to smithereens. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's it's very clear it, it animated some of your priorities. Like your the 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 amount of effort that you spend on you know agent orange removal and demining. I mean yes. it's very clear that this that this story stayed with you as you made important policy decisions. Well I, I believe you can't change the future if you can't be honest about the past. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was incumbent on the United States of America to be honest about the past. And I thought if we didn't finish the job of cleaning up unexploded ordinance, if we didn't finish the job of fullest possible accounting, and if we didn't finish the job of cleaning up Agent Orange, 
then we were deluding ourselves about the past and about our own responsibilities uh, yeah. for what happened in the past. So the hardest thing bureaucratically I ever dealt with in my career was getting the resources to finish the job of cleaning up Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. It was expensive. It's not glamorous. But I thought it was really important because people were still, still being affected by dioxin, even when I was there as ambassador. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there was a time that I walked by this village where, where the water was still, still had dioxin in it. And there were kids playing, kids the age of my kids, yeah. playing in the stream, people fishing out of there. And I just knew that had to be fixed. We could, because yeah. just, just exposed. You know, it's it's a it's a sentence because the dioxin stays in the system to the fourth generation, so yeah. the birth defects will. I mean, the the health effects, the birth defects will not only affect those little kids I saw, but their children, their children's children, and their children's children's children. Yeah, absolutely. not to put you on the spot, Ted, but I just so that people that are listening understand like how much the U.S. committed to Agent Orange cleanup, like. Like how much was the Da Nang airport project or the Bien Hoa airport project? Do you remember off the top of your head how much? Yeah, I mean, it was really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why it, it, I think it took so long. Uh, a couple of ambassadors before me had said, oh, cleaning up Da Nang. And, and this was, I think, an innocent mistake, but uh, proposed that it can be done for about $10 million. And it ended up being uh, at least 10 times that much. And mm -hmm. then I think the cleanup of Bien Hoa, um, mm -hmm. I should know these figures exactly, but it's certainly north of 300 million. Million, yeah. And I made the case that you can't just make this a UA, USAID humanitarian project because it will wipe out the entire budget for the, for the entire region. And yeah. so I said, DOD, you got to pony up too. Right. Uh, and that was a long battle to get DOD to, to acknowledge that there was some, it had some responsibility for this cleanup. And in the end, um, it was uh, John McCain, Jim Mattis, and particularly uh, Patrick Leahy yeah. uh, came to the realization that they needed to do this. And this is over the objections of various other people uh, in the administration. I'd, I'd gotten complete um, back of the hand from Rex Tillerson. He said, we're gonna have nothing to do with this. Uh, is that right? Well, uh, but John McCain stepped up. I, so, I, so that was not, you know, not right away. Uh, <laughs> no, I know. No, I for a long time. I know that negotiation that. with John McCain yeah. is very clear in the book. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I want to, you know, st you know, still reflecting back. So on on your sort of before you became ambassador. So there's another big important bike ride that for me as someone who's studied Vietnam is like monumental, right? Which is, and I think you had left Vietnam, but were in Japan or Indonesia at this time had come back for this ride, right? With, um, this is the one where, where um, John Kerry participated and the, um, the different soldiers from North and South um, Vietnam participated in this ride. And I, I know this was really important for you, but I also think about this as a really big step in US Vietnam relations. It sounds really, Simple, but it, you know, but for for me, it was a big deal, and it gave you a chance to ride with John Kerry too, which I, you know. Well, it was it was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. This was a group, uh, mostly veterans, and some of their kids, um, some of whom didn't have the use of their legs, two of whom were blind, um, a one who, because his father had had been exposed to Agent Orange, uh, was born without without legs. Um, the this was a a uh, group of veterans, people uh, uh, disabled or differently abled who rode that whole 1200 miles from Hanoi to Saigon. And actually I was still in Vietnam at the time. I was just, I just opened up the consulate. Oh, and okay. I took, I took um, John Kerry, who was a uh, Senator at the time and Pete Peterson, who was the ambassador, got them suited up on bikes and took them to Vung Tau. And we rode together the last uh, 79 miles of that ride with the veterans and um, it was hot as hell and <laughs> but we got to this phenomenal welcome in Ho Chi Minh City it was the first day of Tet uh, and it was, you know there was a huge big celebration to welcome us mm -hmm. and um, it was it was beautiful because you you had all of these differently abled cyclists yeah. who were kind of yeah. showing 
Vietnam has a lot of people who are disabled for one reason or another. Uh, it showed what was possible. Nothing is impossible. And, uh, and it was certainly uh, at the beginning of my real friendship with John Kerry, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is what led to, among other things, uh, my ambassadorship in this book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, and by the way, John Kerry writes a beautiful foreword in this book, um, you know, about about the book and his relationship with Ted too. So, and um, um, not in the book, but separately, I've heard him praise your bike riding ability too. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't he doesn't tell the story exactly accurately. When he told the story at my swearing in, he said I was riding circles around him, and I was a strong biker, but he's a really competitive guy, and I remember <laughs> him being in front and me having to hustle. He, uh, hustle mm -hmm. to keep up. And Pete Peterson's also very competitive. And so, you know, these were these two older men who might not have been on a bicycle as recently as I, but they <laughs> hustled. Not, not, and the idea of me riding around circles is, is just not true. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, just to, so I want to skip ahead in time to, um, you know, you, um, you know, you, uh, you've spent some time working with Madeline Albright. Um, and um, and you're contemplating putting your hat in the ring to be ambassador to Vietnam. And, and you didn't think at the time that you had much of a chance at this. You thought that there were other people that were um, better, more in line for it than you. Um, so yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, so, you know, why, why on earth would you think that you weren't in line for this? And then second, um, you know, like what, what motivated you to finally kind of toss your hat in the ring? Well, there, there were a number of reasons I worried about whether I had any chance at all. And one was that there were 12 people competing for the job and 11 of them were senior to me. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm gay. I, I, I have an a African-American husband. Um, we have uh, two children of Mexican-American origins. That wasn't kind of the usual uh, portrait of an ambassador. Uh, and when I first joined the Foreign Service, if you were gay, you could very easily be drummed out. The, mm -hmm. the uh, diplomatic security used to go after gay folks and take away their security clearances, which essentially ends your ability to, to work. And so the idea of someone who was you know, openly gay and married as ambassador to a conservative country wasn't really uh, yeah. thinkable uh, at that time. And, but the, I should say, just as a footnote here, um, Ted has also been super influential within the State Department in pushing for better representation of gay diplomats and better opportunities for gay diplomats. Just, um, just you know, as as a footnote to his incredible career, like this has been an important part too. That, um... well, I argued that we shouldn't lose our security clearances, and then I argued <laughs> that our families ought to be treated like other families. Yeah, that was yeah. really it. Was pretty simple. Um, because at the time our families were, our, our spouses were, were treated worse than yeah, yeah. family pets. Yeah, um, you yeah. know, wouldn't be medevaced, um, wouldn't get any travel orders. There was zero support um, mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. in the day for our families. That has all since changed, but yeah, uh, yeah. there was a long period of time where we really did have to fight just for equal treatment. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, uh, so, anyway, so, to, so I took you off track, but to, so yeah, oh, so you, yeah. Well, language. I had the language. Um, I speak Vietnamese, and of the of the twelve people vying for the job, I was the only one who spoke Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And I think there were people who realized that is very important for success in mm -hmm. for, for an an ambassador. And the other thing I had was Pete Peterson was on my side. I'd worked for him when he was the the first ambassador mm -hmm. to Vietnam. He's an amazing amazing man and he had he called john mccain and said this guy would make a good ambassador uh and uh so i i went ahead and threw my hat into the ring and glenn davies who'd been a uh multiple uh, ambassador multiple times when i said you know is this crazy should i should i even be doing this and he said oh go ahead go ahead and it. do it you've got the credentials go for it and he and he gave me a Kind of gave me a push, and I I went for it, and you know, thank God I did. It was the job of a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. So then, okay, so you get the job, and um, and and then I, so I guess I always think there's sort of these 
these three, before we get to the politics and the international issues, there's these three sort of elements that I always think about of as your tenure of ambassador. So one, you know, one is your Vietnamese and, you know, you both addressing the embassy staff in Vietnamese, doing public statements in Vietnamese, um, you know, and, and I think in, you know, even at, there's an event that I am um, in, involved with every year, a big launch of this survey that I do um, that Ted talked about a little bit, and he would come to that event and give the speeches in Vietnamese. Um, and then the, the um, and it wasn't just Vietnamese. I think you, more than anybody I've ever seen in, um, in Vietnam, including U.S. ambassadors and others, invested so heavily in understanding Vietnamese culture. You know, the types of symbolic gestures you took on um, for Tet and things like, um, you know, making sure that you fed the fish, um, you know, you know, cleaning the house. The, um, so the, the second thing that I always think about your tenure is the bicycle diplomacy. You continued to bike ride all over the city and made that an important element of, you know, how people saw you, you were out there visible. And then, and then the third part that I think about is, you know, your relationship with your family and how you made, you decided to make that front and center. Right, like that was you. That was an important part of how you introduced yourself to Vietnam, and I, you know, and I just, I, I just want to thought think, hear a little bit about these three decisions. You know, obviously you already had Vietnamese, but I know for a fact you invested even more heavily in learning it before you came, and and in addition to the cultural elements, but also these other two decisions about the bikes, and then also making your family front and center in the way you you approached Vietnam. Well, uh, first, thank you. Um, on the language and culture piece, that to me is like really simple. You, if you show respect, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, there are no limits. Everything's possible if you can, if you can show respect. And mm -hmm. uh, to me, I mean, like, Vietnamese is a hard language, um, but I feel that I feel respect for the Vietnamese people, for their language, for their culture, for their history. I didn't have to fake it. Uh, that respect is real, and I just tried to show it. Mm -hmm. And so when I did the, you know, put the the fish in the in the in the lake, or or um, did calligraphy, or whatever it was to sh to to show respect for Vietnamese culture, it's because I felt that respect. Mm -hmm. And so it, to me, it was it was a, a very natural thing to do to to try to show respect. Um, the bicycle diplomacy. Uh, a friend, Kathy, um, uh, former ambassador to, to uh, Korea, uh, a friend of mine had ridden up and down the Korean peninsula a couple of times. And I realized you can do something that you really love. It can actually be helpful. Uh, and I love to bike. And so, you know, I biked everywhere as ambassador. And it really is it's a, it gives you kind of a different impression of the country and I think gives the country a different impression of you than if you're in a limousine with tinted windows or flying over because you're, you're there and you can stop by the side of the road and you know, chat with a vendor or learn what people are, are, are thinking and you can do that better on a bike than in a limousine. And, and I would take friends with me on on bicycle trips, we rode a, a big group of us rode from uh, Hanoi to to Hue to the citadel, and then another time we went up to Hazang and we went around the delta and we went uh, in the central highlands. And each time, it gave me an opportunity, I thought, to connect with people and to show my interest in the country and not just in the bigwigs in Hanoi, but of everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the the piece you mentioned about family, well, I didn't know any other way to do it. I mean, I think the, I, I think you're always gonna be better at being yourself than trying to yeah. be somebody yeah. else. So, uh, you know, I arrived with with uh, my husband and, and son and our, our, our daughter was born a little bit later, but also with my mother who was in her <laughs> mid eighties at that point. And I think the reason, one of the reasons people could, even though we were not the usual family, people could identify with us because we were Mozadin Batehe. We were a three generational family. Yeah. And not a traditional three generational family, but a three generational family none, yeah. nonetheless. Yeah. And that was, I thought, easy for people to, to understand. And what I found over time was that uh, young people in particular who uh, were maybe not 
100% certain about their sexual orientation or not certain about where it might lead them in life, uh, like the fact that we could have family and a job yeah. and yeah. be who we were. And so we found come everywhere we went, we would have people come up to us and say, you know, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and then yeah. we, yeah. Ruth Bader Ginsburg paid a visit. Yes, um, so this is a great story, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, she came just a few weeks after the Obergefell decision that made yeah. my yeah. marriage to, to Clayton legal in all 50 states. And so we, I wrote to her ahead of time because um, I, I don't know, someone suggested that I do it, a friend suggested I do this. And I thought, well, that's a lot of chutzpah, but I did it anyway. And I wrote and said, would you preside over the renewal of our wedding vows? So we'd been married for, for 10 years, at least under Canadian law. Uh, we'd been married for 10 years at the time. We had two children. And she said, yes, I would like to. And she, in our living room in Hanoi, she, she presided over a ceremony that renewed uh, our wedding vows. And I was thinking of it kind of in political terms. You know, I want to show young Vietnamese that yeah, this is yeah. possible, happiness is possible. And um, <laughs> I think what I didn't expect was how much it would mean to us because yeah, we had yeah. two children. Yeah, yeah. Really, I think, you know, the meaning of marriage really sinks in when yeah, you have little yeah. people who <laughs> put on you for everything because yeah. it has a, there's a whole different level of meaning uh, uh, for marriage at that point. And we had our two children with us uh, when she uh, performed the ceremony and boy, that meant a lot because and yeah. she also happened to, uh, she was. She loves children. She loved children, and she was wonderful with our children. Uh, so the the whole mix was one that was very powerful emotionally for us. Right, and and in the in the beautiful ambassador's residence as well. Yes. You know. Um, okay, so I want to move a little bit from the personal into some of your big projects because, um, and I have a list here of them, but we're not going to get to all of them. But I do want to, I guess, let's start, um, Ted. Be with um, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the negotiations into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because I think this may have been the most important comprehensive multilateral trade agreement um, the U.S. negotiated over this period, and um, and getting Vietnam in was 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 no picnic <laughs> because right. it did require comprehensive. Um, labor rights um, commitments on the part of Vietnam, and and this fell on your plate. And so I, you know, I, I really love to hear. And and because in the book, I didn't realize how much interaction you had with the um, former Prime Minister Nguyen Tan Dung about getting this done. So I, I think it would be really great to hear how you pursued this um, and um, and how you were able to manage this. I think it's a diplomatic coup. Yeah. Well, ultimately, I think it was also the most important human rights agreement that we ever concluded with Vietnam. That mm. side letter to the Trans-Pacific Partnership was all about uh, freedom of association for workers, yeah. for unions. So and, let me just add know, a little context here. So, so the Vietnam negotiated a session to the TPP and signed the overall agreement. But in addition, because of the, the importance of labor rights to the US, Vietnam signed a, lot, a side letter with the US that said, if Vietnam joins TPP, it will allow for labor rights, including collective bargaining on the factory floor, right? So, yeah. yeah, so it was the, this is pretty ironic because it's the capitalists telling the communists <laughs> yeah. how to handle yeah. workers' rights. Yeah. And, and so it took swallowing a fair amount of pride for the Vietnamese to, to accept this. But we made it a precondition for Vietnam's entering the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And there was a lot to be gained, not just economically, but in strategic terms for Vietnam by being part of TPP. They saw it as a strategic decision. They wanted to increase their options uh, when it came to dealing with the rest of the world. And it was a, a very complicated negotiation. And then we had this um, hu huge success when it came to workers' rights. And unfortunately, the first day of his presidency, Donald Trump threw it out, uh, withdrew, yeah. withdrew us from the Trans-Pacific Partnership and 
we kind of left the Vietnamese out on a limb. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and particularly in Nguyen Tan Zung, the prime minister who had negotiated it with me, um, I feel like we, we cut off the limb that we'd put him on. Um, but let me back Wait, up. So, yeah, yeah, okay, go back up. I was gonna ask, yeah. what was the limb that he was out on? It was a long negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, it took place over several years and it involved uh, uh, primarily uh, the prime minister Nguyen Tan Zum at the center, uh, supported by his trade and economic ministers. Um, mm -hmm. And it also involved the party because big decisions were not gonna be made just by the government. They also needed to be made by the party. And so it was the reason that I believed it was very important to bring the, the Communist Party General Secretary, Nguyen Phu Chong, to Washington to meet with President Obama, because I felt that was the possibility that we had for unlocking party support for this major, major decision yeah. on the part of yeah. the Vietnamese. And, and that was that's, that was not trivial. Bringing the party secretary to the U.S. was was not trivial. And why was that? Well, it, it's because he's a, a head of a party. And generally, the president of the United States meets with mm -hmm. heads of state, not with party leaders. And so, when I first raised this as a possibility, the answer was no. Uh, no, yeah. no, yeah. you're not bringing the the party general secretary to Washington because that's not who the president meets with. Uh, and it certainly had never happened before. So, um, uh, and I was up against a, a pretty powerful adversary. Her name was Susan Rice and she was national security advisor. And she said, no, this is not gonna happen. And, uh, but I was determined and uh, I approached a friend, Tom Vallely, who yeah. uh, head of the Vietnam program at Harvard, but a close friend of, of John Kerry and a, a close advisor to John Kerry. And I said, we got to figure out a way to do this. And so he went to Kerry, but ultimately we went around the system mm -hmm. and ultimately we persuaded John Kerry that this was an important thing to do. And then he went around the national security advisor and had lunch with the president and persuaded the president this was a for, fortunate, uh, an important thing to do. And to her credit, when the meeting finally happened, uh, Susan pulled me aside and said, Ted, you were right. This was the right thing to do. After mm -hmm. all, so she, and this is, I think, the test of a really, a really fine leader when yeah. she can accept, you know, I made a mistake and then and move on. And she did. And uh, it was a very significant move. And it enabled the party to say the Trans Pacific Partnership, being part of the Trans Pacific Partnership, is in the nation's interest. And we're going to do this. In fact, that meeting unlocked so much cooperation. It, yeah. it allowed the relationship to just take off going forward. So we were, after that, we were able to work together on security, on trade, on the environment, on health, on education, and all these areas that have been kind of closed to real collaboration before. Because, because Vietnam was no longer worried that further relations with the U.S. meant regime change that the right. U.S. was accepting of Vietnam as a one-party system. And so right. we could engage on cooperation. I mean, is that the key to this? Yeah. That is. I mean, because you always have to think, what does the other side want out of this? Well, mm -hmm. certain officials on the other side wanted Vietnam in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but others, including the general secretary, weren't so sure that this was a good mm -hmm. idea. And he, he was one of those who was probably most skeptical about a close relationship with the United States. But what he wanted was a promise that our intent was not to overthrow the government. And so I was asked, you know, what, what is it that uh, the president needs to say? And I said, he needs to say we respect different political systems. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean, you know, we're going to shut up about uh, freedom of expression or human rights or anything like that. But what it means is we're not trying to overthrow Vietnam as we tried in the 60s and 70s, unsuccessfully, I would add. Uh, and, and this was important because if, how can you, it was important to Vietnamese because how can they negotiate with us if our ultimate aim is to yeah. overthrow them? And what we were asking them was to conclude a negotiation that was built on trust. And it's very hard to trust somebody who you think is trying to destroy you. Yeah. And what we were saying is we are not trying to destroy you, we're trying to work with you. And the 
change will come, but it will come in its and it will come gradually. And we're not mm -hmm. going to insist on all of that change at once for you to be partners with us. And I think that's a fair deal. Uh, there's not, I don't like everything about Vietnam's yeah. government or the party. I don't like everything about my own government uh, <laughs> or its parties. Yeah. Um, what we're willing to do is say, we will do, we will be able to accomplish much more together than we're able to accomplish separately. Right. And I think that's true on the kind of geostrategic sense. It's definitely true when it came to trade. So the uh, geostrategic thing is really important here because there's this other part here which is, you know, that, that I'd always wondered about, but you sort of tied the connection tight, more tightly for me in the book is the, the, the re deteriorating relationship between Vietnam and China in motivating Vietnam to, um, to move towards the negotiating table here. And, and I think people would benefit from this story too about the Chinese rig moving into Vietnamese waters and how that sort of um, focused Vietnamese interest. <laughs> I guess. Sure did. Yeah, it sure did. In May 2014, China moved a great big oil rig into Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, into the continental shelf uh, right off the central coast of Vietnam. This was bullying of the highest order. They moved right into Vietnam's territory and said, we're, mm -hmm. we're staking this out. And this is, comes in the context of a lot of tension in the South China Sea. And even those like Nguyen Phu Trong, the general secretary, who were very skeptical about the United States, realized that the old methods that they used to resolve disputes with China weren't working. That China was in full bullying mode. Yeah. And that, you know, party to party ties and the very thing that they'd re relied on before to manage relations with their Northern neighbor were not working. And so they needed friends, they needed other options. And uh, uh, Philippines had gone at that time under different leadership had gone the route of, uh, of an arbitral tribunal to try to get the international system to help resolve the challenges in the South China Sea. And Vietnamese essentially sided with the Philippines, but also sought um, more strategic options by having a closer relationship to the United States. And our job was to open up our arms and accept the embrace. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Barack Obama did. He mm -hmm. opened his arms and accepted the embrace. It was yeah. obviously supported by John Kerry, who believed deeply in improving the relationship. Yeah. And so I found myself completely aligned with the goals of my Secretary of State and, and, and President and enthusiastically kind of took up this charge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and any effective Vietnamese leader is going to balance these relations. It's mm -hmm. going to man, try to uh, do his or her best to manage ties with Beijing while strengthening or in, in, other word, in other ways dealing with the United States. And of course, that's what the Vietnamese did. So before Nguyen Phu Chong went to the Oval Office, he accepted an invitation to visit Beijing. So I think in, Jul in July, he was in Washington in April. Yeah. He went to Beijing and they rolled out the red carpet for him and uh, gave him a visit very high on protocol, not so high on substance maybe, right. but, yeah. but um, that is what a Vietnamese leader must do. Right, because that triangulation, yeah. That, you have no choice, there is no choice. It's mm -hmm. what Prime Minister Pham Minh Chin did uh, just before the visit of uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. He in invited the Chinese ambassador in and, and showed respect mm -hmm. to, uh, to the neighbor to the north. And that's just being smart. It's not, be, you know, it's it's not because. And I think, but I think it's very important for for us to understand that Vietnam has to pace these developments. You right. can't run headlong into the embrace of the United States. You have to be, you have to be moderate about it. You can't immediately accept the offer of visit of a visit of an American aircraft carrier. You have to find out when the right timing is that'll. Cause the because they know that China has the ability to cause them great pain. Yeah, They're, economic and military. Yeah, economic and military. They fought a border war with China quite recently, uh, historically, seventy nine to ninety one. Thousands of people died every year during that mm -hmm. conflict. And then, of course, there were these skirmishes in the South China Sea. And and they know mm -hmm. that you know China has the ability to pretty much shut down mm -hmm. their economy. 
And so they're not going to do things that would enrage the Chinese. They're going to move it at their own moderate pace in improving yeah. the relationship. So, you know, Ted, like, so as you're making these big changes in the U.S. relationship with Vietnam, and I want to sort of shift the discussion just a little bit because, well, one, because we have Vietnamese Americans online, including my own in-laws. <laughs> and, um, um, and, you know, this is a balancing act about also bringing um, the Vietnamese American community on board with these developments and making sure that their interests are, yes. um, are, are accounted for in, um, in, these, um, in these incremental improvements in U.S.-Vietnam relations. And I'm, yes. I, you know, and so you spent some time doing this as well. And, um, and it'd be, um, I think people benefit from hearing some of those interactions with the Vietnamese American community as well. Well, so I went to uh, Orange County a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I went to San Jose, I went to Seattle, Houston, Northern Virginia. I went to places where there were uh, concentrations of Nguyen Mi Y Gop Viet, uh, mm -hmm. the Vietnamese American community, and would, would talk with people and try to understand what their concerns were about reconciliation. And maybe I'll just tell you two quick stories. One concern I heard uh, in Orange County was about a cemetery. And I thought, you know, what, what's this focus on a cemetery? Well, the cemetery is a cemetery in which a lot of Southern soldiers were buried. It's Bien Hoa. And it's near the former U.S. Air Base. Um, and it was deteriorating. And the trees were growing through the graves. And sometimes the graves would float away during, during heavy rains. And this was disrespectful to the dead. Mm -hmm. So uh, people in the Vietnamese American community had asked that they be permitted to clean up the grave sites, dig some ditches, cut down some trees. And I made this request in Hanoi and I was told very difficult, very difficult. It usually means no, um, but I'm stubborn. So I went back again and um, eventually I was able to explain, look, this isn't about flags or symbols or the dead in, you know, in quotations, this is about just digging some ditches yeah. and cutting yeah. out some trees so that people who are dead can be uh, uh, properly honored. And, uh, and it came after, after I departed my job, mm -hmm. I was no longer ambassador, but they said yes. They mm -hmm. said yes, and they allowed it to happen. And those, mm -hmm. those graves were cleaned up. And I feel like that was a step yeah. <laughs> on yeah. this, long road to reconciliation. And, and if, if you'll you know, bear with me, I'll tell one more story. No, no, I wanna hear, yeah, yeah, let's hear it. Now, this is just to show how hard this is. Um, also in Orange County, I was, at one point I met with a very large group, uh, maybe 500 people. And uh, after my talk, um, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Ed Royce said, good job, Ambassador. And, and uh, you know, I thought, okay, I can relax. And then somebody comes up from the audience, an older gentleman, and I'd spoken in Vietnamese, so you know, he knew I spoke Vietnamese, and he grabbed me by the lapels and said, I spent 11 years in a concentration camp. And you know, I said, I'm so sorry. I, I, I wish you hadn't had to go through that. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. And then he grabbed me again, and he said, I spent 11 years in a concentration camp. In a in a an, a re-education camp, mm -hmm. and, and I said, you know, I, I again, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the ambassador to to Hanoi. Is there anything I can do for you? I said I spent eleven years in a re-education camp. This is three times, and I suddenly, maybe a little dense, but it suddenly occurred to me he wanted that time back. Yeah, yeah, and that I couldn't do. And it's, you know, there, there are limits mm -hmm. to what's possible in right, terms of right. reconciliation. He could never be compensated for the suffering that he endured. There are so many families who suffered so mm -hmm. much that they can't, there's, there's no making up. Yeah. There's no, yeah. there's no will, it, there's no, I want to be part of this reconciliation. No, some people suffered too much for that to be possible. Right. right. And, and I think that, and it's important to appreciate that as their kids are going back 
to do business in Vietnam or to travel to Vietnam or people are talking about, you know, um, you know, all the cool things that you can do as a tourist in Vietnam to appreciate how much people lost and what that and what in at that time and that that time is not coming back and that needs to be understood in how we approach this relationship. I think that's exactly right. I think it is. And I think it's a it's a generational shift that's occurring. And I think very often the younger generation of Noemi Igopiet is more open to reconciliation than some of those who mm -hmm. suffered most directly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's something that we need to understand and respect. Yeah. So Ted, we've taken up over an hour. I still have two important questions that I wanna ask you, I, but I know that you're really busy with work. I mean, would you, would you be willing to give us a, 15 extra minutes. Yeah, okay. and I see there, there are questions. I, I There uh, are questions. I'm going to get to those too. Yeah, okay. so, um, but I before I get to those questions, I do want to, you know, we've already talked about your disappointment at the Trump withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I think was, you know, you were you were still ambassador at that time when, yes. when that happened. And, but I also wanted to get into some of the other debates that you had in the new direction of the Trump administration um, and how that you know, eventually led to your decision to resign from your post. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah, well, uh, I was asked by the, uh, the new administration to facilitate the deportation of of uh, Vietnamese Americans who were subject to deportation orders. And, let me explain this, what this means in, in layman's terms. People who had come to the United States between the years of 1975 and 1995, refugees for the most part, some of them boat people, uh, some of them people who fought side by side with Americans in the war, and even sometimes the children of, of US soldiers. Uh, mm -hmm. But, and they had been kind of exempted from deportation orders up till this time uh, because of the circumstances that they had faced that very often, you know, come with nothing, not even knowing English. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the kids, uh, you know, got involved in gangs. There were some, you know, things like carjackings, there were uh, robberies. There were people who were in, uh, in dire straits who made not some great, some not great choices. Yeah. And sometimes they made these decisions when they were very young and then went on to have full lives in the U.S. after those early mistakes. Yeah. Exactly. Like there was a guy named Tuan who I think had been involved in stealing a car and had then been uh, go gone to prison for the, the stealing the car for some years in prison and then got out of prison, got himself together, got married, had children, um, had uh, owned a grocery store, was paying millions of dollars in taxes each year and had 50 people working for him. So he'd really turned his life around. And they said, nope, you're gonna go back to prison for that old crime that you've already done time for. And then we're gonna deport you to a country with this flag yeah. that you don't yeah. even know and that you've had really nothing to do with in your adult life. And then- And who doesn't people. trust you, <laughs> right? Who trust you. And yeah. probably yeah. you'll end up in prison again. That's mm -hmm. what they were doing. And it was being driven by a guy named Stephen Miller. Um, and I believe that what this would not have happened if these folks were Norwegian. I believe that this was essentially racist. The policy was essentially racist and was ignoring our painful history with Vietnam. And I thought it was about as un-American as <laughs> anything I could think of. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do this. Mm -hmm. And I stuck sticks in the spokes. I slowed things down. I wrote messages to Rex Tillerson and to McMaster at the White House and to Jim Mattis. And um, I couldn't get because, any answers for a long because time. Because they were asking you to negotiate with your Vietnamese counterparts, the repatriation of these. How, how many were there? Right, there were 8,000. 8, and at one point I was told to threaten the Vietnamese with no port courtesies until they would speed up the rate of deportations. And I went, actually I told uh, a senior official this is what they're threatening. And he said, no port courtesies. Well, that's easy. Then we won't come to the United States anymore. In other words, if, they were, if we were gonna disrespect Vietnamese officials, and this is in the lead up to a visit by the president of the United States, by the way, mm -hmm. then they would simply not cooperate. And, and so I said you know, to the 
administration, all of this progress that we've been making, we're going to lose. And by the way, your president, when he comes to the APEC summit, our president, uh, Donald Trump, is going to have a terrible visit because we won't have been able to, to uh, work things out in advance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I say this, you're going to bring up on, you're going to, you're going to no, put a nosedive in this relationship we're working on so hard for so long. You're going to yeah. destroy it. And um, uh, any, anyway, I, I could, I never got a, a response until I finally resigned and said, I'm, I'm just not going to be part of this. I, uh, so I resigned. And a few weeks later, I did, finally got that message from Rex Tillerson saying, you got to, you know, you have to keep doing this. You have to keep doing these deportations. Uh -huh. So I thought at that point, the duty of a citizen when his government is really wrong is to speak out. And so yeah. I speak out. And I, I just thought this should be known. This is all being done behind closed doors by this guy, Stephen Miller. Uh, and this is a political decision. And it yeah. should be one that the public knows about. And right. so I made it public. And uh, that made a lot of people very upset. But yeah. I felt yeah. To, to shed some light on some on I thought something that was very dark and very wrong and uh, unfortunately a lot of people agreed with me and they were uh, ultimately those deportations were slowed down especially because the uh, people who were proposing them started losing elections yeah that's yeah well that, yeah and I mean and you were I mean I do, I do think it was really important that you did try to communicate it though I, though I don't I do think with everything going on in the you know, with with migration issues in the U.S., that right. I think this was a this was a minor story in a larger story that I think to some extent got lost. You know, and I, which is one of the reasons I wanted to highlight it today. Okay, so um, there are some questions in the chat. So let me, um, okay, let me sort of I'll do. Um, okay, so th there are some really good ones here. Um, so we have um, so one from. Um, Rick Doner, who's um, eminent political science professor at Emory University focused on Southeast Asia. Um, and he asked, you know, how did you manage and acknowledge US responsibility for the damages of war without exposing yourself to allegations of apologizing for US guilt, right? So how did you address both the US and Vietnamese audiences in, in, in dealing with this, um, um, you know, issue? So this was a tension. Uh, and I would just actually mention the, the example of Bill Clinton. Bill mm -hmm. Clinton, because he had been accused of being a draft dodger uh, during the campaign, when he fight, went to Vietnam, there was norm, enormous scrutiny. Would he apologize? Would he say anything that involved mm -hmm. apologizing for the past? And of course, he was very careful not to do so. But he took some responsibility because he started these processes of cleaning up unexploded ordinance, continued the process of fullest possible accounting, and started some processes which eventually led to the United States assuming responsibility for cleanup of Asian Orange. So I tried to do kind of the same thing. Yeah. Take responsibility for the past and do everything possible to address the painful past without going around apologizing. I don't think, I think an apology is actually not as useful if you're not going to do anything about it. And I right. think it means a lot more if you're willing to actually take some responsibility. So that was how I tried to resolve the tension. And I don't know if I did it perfectly, but I did I did the best I could. Yeah. No, I think I think I mean well, I got to be a witness to it. I thought you handled it about as about as well as could have been handled, you know, in, in that situation. There's um there's a, a really um touching question from Molina Kasor, who's um, a grad student at Duke School of Medicine's Department of Population and Health Sciences. Um, she, said, she says she's a member of the Montagnard community. So um, the, these are, you know, that live in the Northern mountainous areas of Vietnam. Um, she says who are allies of the United States and are disproportionately affected by the Vietnam War and transition here to the United States. And she wants to know as an indigenous person navigating the effects of the war and policies, what are your thoughts in the progression to create trust with Vietnamese communities, specifically like hers, of the, you know, the Hmong population or Montagnard population in the United States? So this is a, a particularly pertinent question when you think about what is happening to uh, ethnic minorities in 
the Central Highlands and the Northern Highlands of Vietnam, because it's not like this is all over. The, the Vietnam has 56 different ethnic groups, but there's a dominant group called the Kin that speaks Vietnamese. And then there are these other ethnic groups which are mostly, and to, to at least to a large extent, relegated to mountainous parts of the country. And what I did was I made sure that I went to these parts of the country to see what was happening to uh, ethnic minorities. And one of the things that I tried to uh, shed light on was the fact that many young Montagnards or uh, uh, is, the, is the Vietnamese word, were being, were being educated only in Vietnamese. So Montagnards would send their kids to elementary school and their kids wouldn't understand the language of instruction. So then they would lose years of education as a result, which meant they were kept in poverty. It was a cycle that was really hard to get out of. And so what I did was I brought this to the attention of the authorities and I allied and made sure that we were uh, allied with groups who were very supportive, including veterans groups who knew how brave Montagnards had been in, in uh, siding with the Americans uh, during the war. And um, I don't, you know, I believe we moved the needle somewhat. I, I like to think we, we moved the needle somewhat. What I did see was uh, progress in the area of religious freedom. And I thought this was super important when it came to um, people who were very often Christian, Catholic um, and living in the, in the mountainous areas. It was uneven, but we were able to uh, urge, and I think some to, to some degree be successful in bringing about greater religious freedom uh, for, uh, for ethnic minorities. And, and even the laws changed even while I was there and we were able to go to places where we, we felt that uh, people were still being uh, persecuted and, uh, and address very directly uh, the, the sources of persecution. And I think we changed things. So that was my role, was on the Vietnam side. My role is not so much, was not so much on the US side, how we, how we deal with these challenges uh, in the United States, uh, but more to see what we could do to make sure that those people had sided with us during the war, uh, weren't, gonna, weren't in, a perpetual, uh, in a perpetual downward cycle in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. that's a great answer. So there's a, there's a question here from William Greenwood, which I think is a really interesting question. Um, and when you read the book, you see all the different interlocutors you had in Vietnam, not, not just government leaders, but also civil society members, even some um, dissidents um, like Madame Mushroom. So he asked, you know, which of these Vietnamese interlocutors that you had, did you respect the most? Yeah. So, one whom I respect a, a great deal was the vice foreign minister, uh, Hakim Ngo. And he came up very early in my time as ambassador and said, you know, you got to do two things. There, there are two things we should do. One is invite Nguyen Phu Chom to the Oval Office, which I told, mm -hmm. and I told the story about that earlier. <clears throat> and I think he was right. That was something that altered the trajectory of the relationship. And the other thing he said was we have to move from a situation where we're cooperating bilaterally to one where we collaborate on regional and global issues of importance to everyone. In other words, um, what, what can we do to look beyond ourselves, to look beyond this relationship and engage together on big issues that will make us really partners? And so, and then we proceeded to do that. We proceeded to work together on climate change and on public health and on peacekeeping, a country that had been su has suffered so much from war, mm -hmm. uh, a major contributor to peacekeeping and sent its first units to, to Sudan uh, during the time I was ambassador. So I thought he brought great, great ideas uh, yeah ideas and is kind of emblematic of the fact that Vietnam has become, you know, among the uh, Southeast Asian nations, probably the most effective when it comes to uh, diplomacy. Not, not a lot of headlines, 
not a lot of, uh, you know, not a, not a lot of attention drawing, but quiet, effective diplomacy within Southeast Asia. Yeah. And this is in a part of the world where there, traditionally it's been the Singaporeans or the Indonesians who provided leadership. Well, I think Vietnamese uh, behind the scenes have been providing a whole lot of diplomatic leadership. Yeah, no, I think that's, and that's not an accident either. I mean, they've invested very heavily in their diplomatic academy and, and the U.S. played some role in that, in, in helping provide resources yes. to train U.S. Diplomat, Vietnamese diplomats at the diplomatic academy and fellowships to the U.S. So, yeah. Yes, we did. And I, I think all of those educational investments had, were, were fantastic investments. You think of what, you know, what Fred Brown, the late Fred Brown did by bringing all these uh, rising officials to Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and earning their master's degrees here, or to Fletcher, mm -hmm. and 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 then uh, or what, Tommy Vallely's program, yeah, or Tommy Vallely's program, Fulbright Economic Teaching Program, which right in situ in Vietnam uh, yeah. uh, trained provincial officials in modern economics, taught them the vocabulary and the concepts of modern economics, and then and today Fulbright University. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, a, and the work that's being done by Arizona State University. These have been, and, and Fulbright in general, by bringing people to the United yeah. States. And I have These to give one call out because I was on it, Vietnam Education Foundation. <laughs> Vietnam Education Foundation, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Um, all of these have been investments in the future. And mm -hmm. I think really, really good investments. And ultimately the ones that make long-term, sustainable, lasting change. And I think it's better to partner and be there making change than to than to to hold your potential partner at a distance. Yeah, absolutely. I don't like the, the, the you know the the politics of shunning. Uh, yeah. I don't think that works. I think it works to engage. If you want to move the needle, then you have to engage. And sometimes it's messy, but you do it anyway because that's what that's what <laughs> brings about real change. Yeah. Um, okay, there's, I have one more question um, from the group. This one is not, you know, this isn't something you reflected on in the book, but obviously something that you're, I'm certain that you're thinking of now um, in your new job with the U.S. Um, ASEAN Business Council. Yeah. So where do you see the future of U.S.-Vietnam relations headed in the context of a more assertive China? And how has COVID complicated this relationship, particularly in light of manufacturing such shutdowns in Ho Chi Minh City? So every Vietnamese village or city has in it uh, streets named after Ngo Quyen or the Hai Bat Chung or mm -hmm. uh, Bat Chiu. These are heroes, Vietnamese heroes who fought against the Chinese. Even with an assertive China, I think you can count on Vietnam to mm -hmm. resist, <laughs> resist foreign domination in any form. Vietnam, it's in the DNA of Vietnamese people to, to strive for and maintain their independence. Mm -hmm. And so that I think is just a fact that Vietnam is gonna to continue to be an independent player and won't take instructions from anybody, not from us, not from the Chinese, not from anybody. Um, so I see uh, as, as the United States tries to figure out how to deal with a rising China, uh, I think we have friends in this process. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, formal relations like um, AUKUS, the, the relations with the UK and, and Australia, uh, uh, the Quad, which brings together four democracies. Uh, we have formal mm -hmm. web of alliances. And then we have friends mm -hmm. and partnerships like mm -hmm. with uh, Vietnam and, and Indonesia. Those are, those are partnerships, they're friendships. Yeah. And we will have to deal with those nations, those partners, as equals with respect, because that's that's where it's it's possible to to find common interest is if you deal with your partner with respect, mm -hmm. and I think we need to do that. And then when it comes to COVID, in some I don't see this as a as a permanent setback of the trajectory, the very positive trajectory that we're on. There has been a dip when it comes to trade because of uh, supply chains being fouled up and uh, transportation being as challenging as it's it's been. Safe movement of people and goods across borders is much harder under COVID. But there's also uh, a need for resilient supply chains. And Vietnam 
Intel, for example, has invested billions of dollars in Vietnam and has its largest uh, semiconductor manufacturing operation right outside, outside of Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah, one of and the most it, technically sophisticated as well. Yeah. It is. It mm -hmm. is. And you know, the same op opportunities, I think, exist for Malaysia and the Philippines. But mm -hmm. you, you're going to, and maybe Thailand as well, you're going to see more diversification on the part of multinational companies and more reliance on ASEAN nations, I think, than just relying on, on production in China. And I think that's healthy, that, that uh, diversification is healthy and there are gonna be opportunities there for, for countries like Vietnam that have decided that they want to have an innovation economy. Now they've also set up some, own, their, some of their own obstacles to uh, innovation. I would love to see those obstacles removed so that Vietnam can really achieve its aspirations and grow and prosper and its, you know, its talent and entrepreneurship can be unlocked. Uh, but those are decisions that Vietnamese people will ultimately make. And I, yeah. I, I have, I'm optimistic that they'll make the right ones. Yeah. Um, Ted, we only have, you know, like just four minutes left, <laughs> but I, um, you know, if um, I think we've covered a lot in the book, you know, I just want to there's there's a few things that I want to say that really touched me that we didn't get a chance to talk about, which was you negotiating a U.S. aircraft carrier visit to Da Nang that brought thousands of American soldiers, you know, into the sailors into Da Nang and like the complexities of negotiating that, but then also the symbolic value of that. Um, the work that you did on the Obama visit, um, you know, um, from from the big events that he did um, to the small ones, having Buncha, you know, you know, with Anthony Bourdain, um, um, and I should and say, the woman I rapper. Think, Don't forget what? the woman rapper. Yes, the, and the the female rapper with yes, that um, meeting him on the trip, um, and um, and then I and then just I thought um, I I really hope a whole bunch of people read this about you facilitating John Kerry to go back and, um, and visit the place where he had um, fired on and, and killed an American Viet Cong soldier that um, led to him being awarded the Silver Star, but then was um, heavily in, disputed when he ran for president. And him going back, um, I, yeah, maybe you can reflect a little bit on that because you were there um, and know him so well about how that, what that trip meant to him. Well, it was it was very significant to him because it was kind of a vindication that the the people who had uh, supported George W. Bush and in, in, during the race between uh, John Kerry and George W. Um, had the swift these are the swift voters for truth I think they called themselves they had lied about about the person that uh, uh, John Kerry had had shot. In, and, and earned his silver star. They had said, well, it was a kid. And we went back to the place where, the, where uh, John Kerry had earned the silver star. And we, there was a, an eyewitness there who said, that was no kid. He was in his 20s. He was a hardened gorilla. And he would have killed you if you hadn't killed him first. And, and I think you could sort of see a, a weight lifted from John mm -hmm. Kerry's shoulders because this person had told the truth about what really happened 50 years ago. And I'm glad we were able to get him to that spot so he could, he could have that. Um, this was just, just as he, in his last days as Secretary of State. It was a it was very emotional, emotional yeah, trip. Yeah. And if I could say just sort of one general thing about the, the book. Um, if you're mm -hmm. looking for a kind of dense policy tome with a lot of data and specific policy recommendations and so on, this is not the book for you. I love what Professor Molesky wrote, which is it's also a good summer read because that was my goal. I, I felt like, you know, we're wired for stories. My goal was to tell stories. And I, you know, I sat in the front row for a long mm -hmm. time and had a, uh, you know, was a witness to people taking amazing risks for reconciliation. And I felt an obligation, a compulsion to record these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a book of stories about people who I think were brave. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's, it definitely comes across those stories, but, I, but I'll say that, that you, you are telling stories and they are compelling and they're page turners. And this is the second time I've had a chance to read this book. And I, and I found myself like really 
spending a lot of time on the intricate details that you spent, but I'll, but what I'll say is like, as someone who has worked on Vietnam for a long time, but you dot your I's and you cross your T's. The historical references are always accurate. The cultural references are always so well researched and on point. It's a story that experts can, it, these are stories that experts can learn from. And I think um, there's a reason that I said that this should be in the classroom as well as a summer read. And, and Ted, I just wanna say, you know, we've been friends for a long time and we've worked together for a long time. I, I think this book, is vital to the sort of documenting the history of U.S. Vietnam relations, and I think you yourself, um, you know, you are you are a symbol and a monument to U.S. Vietnam relations. So thank you much, so much for everything you've do, you've done, and thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you, thank you, Eddie, and thanks to everybody who joined us today. It's a real pleasure for me to to talk with you and to share some of these stories. Thank you.